Morning all. Good morning, everyone. All right, let's um, let's do this. Don't forget, if you're new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. It is now mission 30,000 subscribers. We are trying to get to 30,000 before September. So everyone hitting that subscribe button, liking and sharing the videos. It all helps, peeps. It all helps. Don't forget, Sunday session this evening, 7.30. Um, the reason I'm starting a bit earlier, well, two reasons. Number one, um, I'm not doing that show with Andy Cole. The, the main host is now back. So that Sunday session that I was doing with Andy Cole on TalkSport is no longer for me, but um, it was fun. I enjoyed it. So that means I can start it a bit earlier. And the second reason, the most important reason, is because Line of Duty is at nine o'clock and we're not missing that. So 7.30 Sunday session, a wrap of all the weekend's boxing and just a good old chinwag about, you know how it works now, about anything, right? It's just a nice, fun space for all of us to be and get along. Anyone chatting shit gets kicked out or gets blocked. You know how it works now, peeps. All right, um, let's talk about Jamal Harry and Carl Frampton. Um, yeah, difficult to watch that if you're a Carl Frampton fan, just because Carl Frampton's such a nice guy, such a great guy. And um, you could almost see from the very first round that there was gonna be a problem in that fight. It, it was difficult going. I, and I said this, during the live stream. Thank you so much to everyone that jumped on the live stream yesterday, by the way, 16,000 of you. But I said this on the live stream yesterday that Carl Frampton and the team are gonna be banking on Jamal Herring getting tired in the second half of the fight. But I said, will Carl Frampton get to the second half of the fight? That was that was the, what they were banking on. Everyone knows Jamal Herring walks around quite big and has to cut a lot of weight. Not that he doesn't live the life, but he's still a big guy, right? This is a guy that I'm guessing is about 5'10". He's a big guy. Yeah, 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, to get down to 130 pounds isn't going to be easy. So they would, they would have been banking on him tiring out for the second half of that fight. They mentioned in the lead up to this one that, you know, Jamal Herring's only just come into Dubai. He's not going to be acclimatized. I mean, there's going to be a problem and all that. So that's what they were banking on. Frampton didn't get to the second half of the fight because Jamal Herring was just too good. That's what it comes down to sometimes. I've said this so many times. Carl Frampton's a good little man. Good little man. Um, Jamal Herring's a good big man. A good big man always beats a good little man. The only exceptions are is when the little man's a great little man, a Loma, a Floyd, a Pac-Man, a Marquez, you know, a Barrera. When you're that good, then fine, you can give away a bit of weight. If you're not a great little man, you can't give up weight like this. And in the ring, I saw two guys, good fighters, separated by nearly two weight divisions. No joke, they might have weighed in at 130 pounds on the scales day before yesterday, but I would say Jamal Herring probably entered that ring about 148. Jamal Herring, looked Jamal Herring just looked like a welterweight, didn't he? He just looked like a welterweight in there. Carl Frampton, who we know can, it would be hard, but can make 126, probably weighed in 136. That's a lot to give. And then you add that into the fact that Jamal Herring's got um, a great jab, right? Keeps good distance. And then even when Carl Frampton came in close, which he was going to have to try and do at some stage, got bullied a couple of times. Like Jamal Herring just literally, there was one stage, I think it was either the first or the second round, where Jamal Herring looked like he almost picked Carl Frampton up and turned him onto the ropes. And that was almost a case of saying, I'm stronger than you. Like, you, if you want to come inside, fine, we can have that battle. I'm stronger than you. Here, I'll show you. And if you're going to stay on the outside, I'm going to pepper you with my jab and sting you with a couple of couple of lefts. And that's what he did. And that's what he did. Like I gave every single round to Herring. There was one close round. I think it was round three. It might have been. Or round four. I can't remember the rounds. There's one close round, but I didn't think Frampton had enough to win that round. That's almost the case. That if you're a Frampton fan, you're looking to give him a round. So you give him that round rather than be neutral. If you're a Frampton fan, Fra and Frampton lands a couple, which he did, you're thinking, oh, Frampton's done enough. He didn't do enough. Didn't win that round. So in the end, um, Herring was just too good for him. And I think um, it's a bit sad because I don't consider Herring the best in the division. Do you know what I mean? I always felt that when Frampton and his team looked at Herring, they probably looked at, okay, who is the weakest champ in this division? And that's not discrediting Herring because the champs are like 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, as in, you know, they're all very closely matched, but they looked at Herring as that's the weaker champ. Let's go for it. 
people do this in boxing. You look at a route and you think, okay, that's the route we want to go. Because you look at the other guys in the division, I mean, Javonte Davis has a belt in that division. Jojo Diaz didn't, but at the time, I think of the fight being made, he did. Um, Oscar Valdez didn't, but Miguel Bichelt did. Do you know what I mean? I mean, pff, Jamal Herring, that's the one you take, right? That's the one you take. Frampton was doing this thing with his left, which I really don't like. He was pouring it out. He kept on doing that. And that might be good because you can do that and your opponent doesn't know where the punch is then coming from. But he didn't really throw any jabs. And it's, and it's just because of the reach as well. Like, he was so far on the outside because Herring's was, arms were so far forward that he was doing that and he couldn't even reach Herring. So when he did, he had to take risks to come in. And as he came in a couple of times, he got caught. Got caught with a nice straight left, really clean one-two down the pipe, put him down first. And then the uppercut, which folded him. Do you know what I mean? Herring was landing some really good shots. And if, if you're Jamie Moore and Tra Nigel Travis and the team, you would have known that's what Herring was going to do if you came in like that. If you're, if you're coming in, head down, just from his Aquendo fight, that's, that's how he put Aquendo down, with a beautiful uppercut. I mean, Herring, that, that was a career best performance from Herring, by the way. And in the lead up to watching, or doing the live watch, I actually watched Herring's last three fights. That was a career best performance. That was better than he won when he won the world title away from home. It was better. It was better. Um, but look, size matters, man. Size matters. Unless you are legit, size matters. I think we've almost made it a thing now of becoming two, three, four weight world champions is easy. It ain't easy. It ain't easy, especially when, again, if you're a Frampton and this isn't discrediting Frampton, by the way. I love Frampton. I mean, I've got some old videos that I'd done with Ryan back in the day when me and Ryan were talking about Scott Quigg versus Frampton. I'm a fucking Frampton fan. But Frampton has never been super fast. Frampton has never been super quick. Frampton's had good boxing IQ. Frampton, sorry, did I say Frampton? Frampton's had good boxing IQ. And that's great. But he's never been like... You don't look at Frampton and think, oh, supreme athlete. You don't do that, do you, right? Because... Um, his speed isn't, oh my God, it's unbelievable, like a Pac-Man, or his power's crazy, you know. He hasn't got the, the Loma kind of movement, right? He's just a very good boxer. And sometimes, going up and wait, that isn't enough. Good on uh, Herring, though. I'm so happy for Herring. I mean, his backstory is incredible. And I'm just happy that he got paid. I'm, I'm so happy that he got paid. And, you know, his next fight, which might be his last, maybe he's 35 himself, he'll get paid again now because he's gonna, now got that very good win on his CV as a world champion. Shakur Stevenson, he's his mandatory. I don't know if he can have a voluntary in between, um, but he'll get paid for his next fight regardless, even if he loses, which he might not, you know, I think let's not underestimate him now. But even if he does, he's kind of just at the tail end of his career, made a couple of good paychecks and I'm more than happy for him. If I'm honest with you, more than happy. Um, Carl Frampton retires. He always said he was going to retire if he did lose. Um, some people say things like, if you're talking like that, it's almost like you've got one foot out the door. Maybe, right? As soon as you kind of mention the word retirement, as soon as you start to like retire, then maybe the mindset is, okay, that's it. But even it's a long career. It's a long career. It's a solid career. He has some really good fights. Some really good fights, man. I mean, that Scott Quigg one was fantastic and that's why it's so sad to see how this has all ended with the McGuigans because I thought that link up I loved it if I want to see I absolutely loved it and this is no discredit in Nigel Travis and Jamie Moore but I thought that McGuigan link up was just special it really was like in the lead up to that Shane McGuigan fight the way McGuigan Barry this is was defending Carl in sort of the presence of Scott Quigg and uh, Eddie Hearn, it was almost like it was his dad. Like he was like, you are not beating my man. And I remember when um, Carl won and they're interviewing McGuigan and they're talking about, you know, the fact that Carl had to go to travel really to Manchester for that fight. And he says, um, like, I think he said something along the lines of, this is Manchester, but almost like this is Ireland now. Like, you know what I mean? Because they brought so many fans over from Northern Ireland. So it says, it's basically like that. Like, we took, we took this place over. And that was, 
just special. The Leo Santa Cruz fight, the first one, special. Even the Kiko Martinez fights coming up, special. I mean, he was a very, very good fighter. But for me, although Leo Santa Cruz was the, the international fight, right? The fight that put him on the world stage. Um, Scott Quigg, again, we love a British dust-up, don't we? And that Scott Quigg one was just special. It really was. I think there was, what, 20,000 in the MEN arena. And it was um, one, of, one, of, one of the good British boxing nights of the last sort of 10, 15 years. It really, really was that good. I actually... Even the Nita, Nita, Nita Denaire, sorry, was good. For some reason, I expected, I don't know what it is. I, I don't know if I expected a bit more from Frampton. That's going to sound stupid, but I, maybe I, I did, or maybe I, I don't know. Like maybe Watching him come through and fight in the kind of small hall shows, not small hall, but the smaller shows, I actually thought, my God, this is going to, like we've got one here. And we did have one, don't get me wrong, but I expected a CV full of like 10 or 12 massive fights in America. We didn't quite get that. We didn't get that. We might have got something, if you beat Josh Warrington, we might have immediately gone to America and had those big fights. But look, I hate doing this. Great career. Great career. Um, two really good fights against Leo Santa Cruz. Good fight against Josh Warrington. Great fight against Scott Quigg. Even the Denaire fight was good, especially when you went to see what Denaire then went on to do against um, Inoue, right? Put in a really good performance. So that showed that Denaire was still very much serviceable. Solid, man. Solid. It does go back, though. Sorry to sound negative. It does go back, though, to that talk about sort of um, UK fighters or British fighters and so what's going on with um, us and the defeats, right? I mean, we're in tough fights, don't get me wrong, but man, like we're losing a couple, aren't we? We're losing. We're losing. I expected Herring to win. I didn't expect Herring to knock out Frampton. So that's bullshit. I'm lying. I expected it to be a close fight. I expected Frampton to win on points. So, don't know. Don't, everything was built for Frampton in this fight. And what I mean by that, the ring was a lot smaller, which I think would have favoured Frampton going in. Who, who would want a smaller ring, right? Frampton's going to want a smaller ring so he can kind of stop the... He can kind of almost cut off the angles that Herring would try and do to get out of the pocket. Uh, fight was in Dubai. I mean, Herring trains in Colorado. That's a 10-hour difference. He came in late. So, the, so all the advantages were with Frampton going into this fight, apart from the injuries, if I'm honest with you. Uh, disappointing anyway, regardless of that. Um, Jermaine Franklin, not intimidated by Dylan White, eager to fight him. Jermaine Franklin isn't going to get that fight. I get it. So, you know, say those things, my man, but you're not going to get those fights. Um, um, what is this crap? Should we, do you, do you want, I'll read it anyway. Logan Paul fight. Logan Paul, sorry, fight with brother Jake would be one of the biggest pay-per-view events of all time. What is... These two brothers are fucked up, you know. They're weird. Just weird human beings. So money, like... Like, just all about money, aren't they? Like, fucking fight your brother because it would be one of the biggest people and we make loads of money. So what? Have you not got enough money? God, oh, man. Shakur Stevenson, I can go to 140, 147. A lot of people think I'm little, but I'm not. All right, okay, let's um, let's walk before you run, eh? If you don't mind. Yeah? Jeez. Um, let's just see what he does against Herring. I mean, that's the fight, right? 130, and then we'll see it. Well, I, I've always said I think 135 is his landing spot. It's crazy when you think this guy started at 126. But I think 135 is his landing spot. And then you put his name in that mix. We're already excited about that mix. Put his name in that mix, and it's beautiful. I mean, Oscar Valdez could go up as well. Beautiful. There's some guys, 135 is going to be a great division. Although I do think a lot of the 135s will probably go to 140 in a couple of years. Ryan Garcia won't stay around for long. Nor will Devon. Javante looks like he struggles to make weight already. And he's only had a couple of fights at 135. And Tio definitely can't make the 135 limit for much longer. So we'll see what happens. Uh, WBO orders 30-day period, uh, period for Herring to commit to mandatory title defence. Yep, that's Shakur Stevenson. Um, 
I didn't watch the rest of the fight card and I haven't yet watched the fight card Matchroom put on in Uzbekistan. We are going to watch that. I do know, though, that there was a fight from South Africa that everyone, that got beat literally every round. Uh, Imani Colombo, who fought, I think, in Uzbekistan. Now, Imani Colombo, OK, yeah, Israel Madrimov outpoints Imani Colombo over 10 rounds. And, like, ev I'm done wrong. Madrimov, everyone's excited about. Colombo, though... <clears throat> Everyone was really high about in South Africa. When I say really, I mean really high. So they are very... I was reading a couple of like um, fan chat room things with the people I know from South Africa and they're very, very upset about him losing every single round. Look, Majumov's probably going to be a special talent, but they think it's a damning indictment. <laughs> Sound like a lawyer here on South African boxing right now. So yeah, not good. Not a good look. Um, is there anything else before we um, go to my mother's and quickly give her um, a happy Easter hug? <laughs> what else is there? I think that might be it, peeps. I think that might be it. We'll talk about the latest on... Um, AJ Fury um, on the Sunday sessions a bit later. We are hearing that a decision will be made. Decision, I don't like that word. For me, I want the fight to be made, but a decision will be made this week. So the next sort of five to six days. Don't know what that means, but we'll see what it does. Um, oh, this is a good one. Before we go, Erickson Lubin and Rosario agree to fight. Um, Showtime will televise on date to be determined. That's good. Love that. That's a good fight, man. Rosario obviously coming off that loss to Charlo. Uh, Lubin has built himself back up after losing to Charlo. So both of them have, I think it's the same opponent. It is the same at Charlo, isn't it? Um, and lastly, uh, Roy Jones Jr. willing to face Oscar De La Hoya and thrill out pay-per-view clash. Obviously, he is willing. When is he willing? Like, of course he's going to. It's, a no it's a nothing fight and he's going to make millions. <sighs> All right. Uh, we'll see you guys at 7.30. Peace.